Welcome to Black Hat Windows Security Conference 2002, held February 7th through the 9th in New Orleans, Louisiana. The following videotape was recorded live at the conference and produced by the Sound of Knowledge Incorporated. And I'm here to speak about uh, Ethernet uh, level traffic redirection. Um, the entire presentation here is available at the uh, bitland.net slash Tyrannus address. If you have any questions during the presentation, um, raise your hand and I'll uh, try to get to you. There will be some time at the end um, for a uh, question and answer period as well. Um, and you can always email me if uh, it doesn't come up during the speech. Um, Today we're going to cover um, Ethernet ARP cache corruption at a slightly lower level than uh, it was covered at this morning. But we'll try and step through it pretty quickly um, and get to the, the main uh, point of the presentation, which is uh, a piece of code I wrote called Tyrannus, um, which does cam table poisoning on Ethernet switches. We're going to then cover uh, defenses a little bit. Um, I expect that most of you uh, know what a sniffer is and have at least you know poked at some, uh, looked at some uh, uh, Ethernet captures uh, at some point or another. So I presume that most of you are familiar with the OSI model, but uh, just to clarify here, um, TCPIP kind of uh, s squishes the top three levels together a little bit, but um, we're dealing with mainly with uh, the lower levels here. So the physical layer is cabling. Uh, the, at this level, uh, it's just electrical impulses that are, that are forwarded or not. Um, and that's, that comes down to the cabling hubs and repeaters. Um, at the data link layer, um, that's where Ethernet kicks in, and you've got devices like switches and bridges. These um, will actually look at the traffic, uh, examine the addresses that are associated, and then make decisions on what to do. At the network level, we've got things like IP and uh, things that kind of bridge the data link level and uh, the network level, like ARP. So we're going to cover a little bit of background on uh, how Ethernet works at the byte level. Um, so the Ethernet header is about 14, well, is exactly 14 bytes long and consists of a uh, destination address followed by a source address followed by a type code. Um, the type code is two bytes long, and uh, the destination and source address are each six bytes. Now, the first three bytes of an Ethernet uh, address are always uh, vendor specific. So the IEEE has a, a list of vendor codes that uh, are associated with each uh, Ethernet card. You can, however, switch, you, you can change this. Like um, on a Linux box, you can do it with, uh, with ifconfig. Most other things, you, uh, most other operating systems, you'll have to do it uh, either at the, the hardware level. You can often get uh, a configuration disk for your uh, NIC that will let you set the uh, 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 MAC address through that. Um, you can do uh, some interesting stuff with passive fingerprinting and figure out uh, you know, if it's a Sun 3C versus, say, an UltraSpark, just based on the vendor code and uh, the last three bytes that uh, have been assigned. Now, um, for machines to be able to communicate, um, if they know the IP address that they want to send to, they can either, uh, they need to know the physical hardware address associated with that. Um, so rather than have a system where everyone has to keep a, a list of, of addresses, address mappings uh, on their machines, there's uh, the address resolution protocol, which allows machines to query, uh, given an IP address, uh, query for the uh, hardware address associated with that. There's also RARP, which allows you to do the inverse, given a, uh, an Ethernet hardware address, find out what IP address is associated with it. Um, normally, when a, a machine needs to communicate with another machine, it'll check its ARP cache to see if it has an entry for that. If it doesn't, it'll send out an ARP query. Uh, there's also something called gratuitous ARP, um, in which when a, a machine is booted, it'll often send out uh, an ARP packet so that other hosts that are listening will update their uh, caches and. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a performance uh, uh, improvement. Instead of having to wait until uh, it has to communicate with that host, it'll, it'll just be in the uh, ARP cache when it, uh, when it needs it. Uh, there's some security problems with that, which I'll get into later. So 
uh, here's a, a, a diagram of an ARP request. So the ARP request is encapsulated in, in an Ethernet header, and you wind up with uh, essentially a, a 14, sorry, 14 byte header and then another 28 bytes of ARP request. So normally an ARP request is sent out to uh, the bro Ethernet broadcast address. Um, and when we're dealing with Ethernet, the uh, uh, address size uh, for Ethernet is six bytes. So we specify the, first of all, the, uh, we specify first the hardware type, which is hex 0001 for Ethernet, the protocol type, um, which is the higher level network layer uh, protocol that we're speaking. In this case, we're doing IP, so the protocol type is hex 0800. And because it's Ethernet, as I said before, we've got a hardware size of six, a protocol size of four for IP, uh, at least as far as IPv4 is concerned. Um, then we specify the operation type, uh, which is hex 0001 for a request. Then um, we fill in the, the various uh, sender information, and then the uh, information we want, which is the target IP address that we're trying to uh, obtain. And we just leave the uh, target hardware address nulled out. This is uh, probably pretty fami familiar to most of you. This is what it looks like in Ethereal when you see one of these packets. Um, and that's pretty much the same information as I just gave you, only uh, broken down slightly differently, more familiar. And then the ARP reply uh, format is the same. The only difference really comes down to the, ARP, the operation has been changed from a request to a reply. And uh, we've actually filled in the target hardware address. So, uh, sorry, also the um, target and sender information has been reversed. And also note that the uh, reply is unicast, whereas the request was broadcast. And again, we see a uh, ethereal uh, display of the same information. So, Originally, we had, um, with Ethernet, uh, a shared backplane. Um, so you had the sort of thick Ethernet. Um, and if one of your transceivers started acting up, you wound up taking the entire network down. Uh, then it went to uh, thin Ethernet 10 base 2. And again, it was a shared backplane. Um, and a little, it was a lot less expensive, but it was vulnerable to what I refer to as the uh, rodent attack. I worked for a little while at a, a, a small uh, manufacturing company out in the country, and uh, they had rats crawling through the walls. So a rat would chew through one of the, the links and your entire network was down. Switches uh, increase performance and availability by having a star topology. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, and they also increase the aggregate uh, bandwidth instead of by creating virtual circuits. They weren't designed for security, but uh, despite problems that have been discovered in the past, people insist on using them that way. Um, also note that when, I, when I'm saying uh, the word switch, uh, you can substitute VLAN uh, at any point if you wish. There, uh, a VLAN is a separate, a functionally, functionally a separate switch. Um, although I'm kind of wondering if some of the, uh, at least the denial of service attack portion of this could be extended uh, uh, with uh, a VLAN hopping attack as well. Um, I'll look into that. So, ARP cache corruption, we've, we've, uh, we talked about a little bit earlier, so I'll run over this pretty quickly. Um, essentially, when a given host uh, sends out an ARP request, instead of just allowing the, the actual host to reply, uh, the attacker just also sends a reply. Now, what happens in this case is, if you're watching all the uh, traffic on the network, say through a uh, a monitoring port, you'll notice that two different MAC addresses are replying to um, a single uh, IP address. Now, this isn't always bad. Um, a lot of uh, clustering software uh, uses this to uh, do failovers. So you can't always flag it. It's, this is not necessarily something you want to uh, say is always bad, but it's something to watch for. 
Um, essentially, once um, the our cache has been updated with this information, and also uh, note that whoever is the last person to respond is often is is the one who gets to uh, update that cache table. And since the uh, uh, essentially the victim machine isn't uh, doesn't know to send it more than once, the attacker always has an advantage. Um, the typical attack is to uh, impersonate the gateway, in which case you get pretty much all the traffic. You can do it for any two uh, nodes on the network as well, though. Um, and since the attacking host knows what's going on, it's easy enough for it to forward information to the real uh, forward information such that neither party on, the, on either end knows what's going on. Um, they don't notice any disruption. So, Detecting our cache corruption attacks is pretty easy, actually, because we know what to look for. Um, given that you can't uh, do something like fragment an Ethernet frame, it's, it's not a meaningful uh, thing. Uh, it would just be discarded. Uh, you know that if you ever see packets with, uh, if you see d uh, traffic such that a given MAC address is responding, sorry, multiple MAC addresses are responding to a single IP address, you know that this is going on, unless you know that, oh, it's my cluster, it's okay. So it's pretty trivial to discover this. You can set up uh, IDSs will look for it. Um, ARP Watch, which is available at that URL, can do that. And it can either just set it up on uh, one copy of ARP Watch per segment, or if you've got uh, smarter switches, managed switches, you can pull the information through SNMP and parse it uh, offline. Um, so a friend and I were, were sitting around and chatting about uh, wondering if we could come up with a better a, a less visible attack with the same, uh, uh, same effect. Um, we noticed that essentially when you, when you plug in a cable on any switch, it just, it just works. If you move from port one to port seven, it just works. Um, occasionally you'll have to wait you know, 30 seconds or so for, uh, for it to realize what's happened. But the switch will just uh, auto-configure itself. And furthermore, uh, you know that it's not relying on the cable disconnect because you can plug a switch into another switch and another switch off that and move from one port on the first switch to one port on the, the last switch and it will still work. So it's not relying on the cable disconnect signal at all. Um, and so we know that just by watching traffic, it's, it's maintaining a, some sort of internal list of uh, port to MAC address uh, mappings. Um, so the question was, can we trick the switch into sending traffic to the wrong port by tricking its auto configuration logic? Um, and I'm here standing in front of you today, so obviously we could. Um, we were wondering if we could basically kick it into a, uh, a limited hub mode. If, you, if it sees traffic for a given MAC address on port one and port three, will it then send to both ports? Um, that's called limited hub mode. Um, next, if we were wondering about just a simple redirection, if you were able to uh, capture all the traffic you wanted from port three on port one instead. Um, then also, if we could do that, was there gonna be a way to rebroadcast that traffic uh, in the manner of an ARP cache corruption attack and get a full man in the middle attack? Um, Lastly, um, kind of like the Mac overflow attack, um, we were wondering, uh, is everyone familiar with the Mac overflow attack? Raise hands if you're not. Okay, um, Mac overflow attack is essentially when you send a bunch of packets with random uh, Mac source and destinations. Eventually, you'll overflow the cam table um, on the switch, which is, the, uh, which is that list of port to uh, Mac address mappings. And then it'll just kick the uh, switch into just a, a total hub mode. Um, all traffic goes to all ports. Problem with that is if you're seeing like all this garbage um, source and destination ad address information, that in, su that in itself is suspicious. So essentially by sending only traffic that you would normally see um, on the network as far as source and destination goes, could you kick it into the same um, uh, hub mode? So 
here are our uh, results. We weren't able to get any uh, tested switch to do that lim limited hub mode where it would send to both port one and port three. Um, we also, it could just be that the switches we had access to didn't do this. We couldn't get them to drop into Mac, uh, sorry, into hub mode using Mac Overflow itself, um, the original attack. So we weren't really able to test um, the limited hub mode with non-suspicious traffic. Um, Last, uh, we were able to get traffic redirected without too much, without any trouble on uh, pretty much all the switches tested, um, with a couple caveats on some of the Cisco hardware. But there was no simple man in the middle attack. Uh, but we may be able to extend the uh, attack so that it's about 95% effective. We fi we figure, and there was a trivial de uh, denial of service on all the tested switches. Um, With the man in the middle attack, what we were hoping to be able to do was um, get the traffic redirected to our port and then resend it to either like an Ethernet broadcast or an Ethernet multicast address and see if it would be picked up by the remote host. Um, when we tested that, that didn't work. Um, that would have been the easy, simple uh, man in the middle attack. I'll get into the more complicated one in a few minutes. So this works because uh, configuration is a, is a pretty complicated thing. Um, and the switches weren't designed with security in mind. They were designed to make life easier for network administrators. Um, only expensive managed switches allow port locking. And um, if you do lock your ports, Anytime that you want to make a change, you have to go and reconfigure the, the, the switch, which is a huge administrative burden, and most people don't want to get into that. Um, and on the Cisco that we did have access to, uh, port lock mode didn't work anyway. Um, if you could cause the remote machine to reboot or a cable disconnect, um, the port lock mode seemed ineffective. That's only on the uh, Cisco uh, 2900, but uh, I. It, it could be that uh, that was just a bad version of iOS. I'd like to, if anyone else is running Cisco hardware, I'd love to hear your results. So just email me at the uh, Bitland address. Um, oh yeah, and if you've got a lot of mobile devices like laptops, port lock mode is, is, is a total nightmare. It can't, you can't really use it. So what is the CAM table? Um, this is essentially just. Uh, uh, a really efficient lookup table. It turns out this is a, a single chip set, a single chip that a lot of uh, vendors use. You feed it um, a, an IP address, it feeds you back a MAC address, or vice versa. Um, it seems like all modern switches that I was able to find use this CAM chip and uh, and the CAM table specifically. Um, more old stuff will, more old switches will have something equivalent that may not be as, as high performance. If you're interested in the CAM table and how it's updated, uh, in particular on Cisco switches, that router god, um, aside from being uh, totally hilarious, is a good place to find out a little bit more. Or uh, the other one is, is specifically on the CAM, uh, cam uh, performance of CAM tables. Um, so this is essentially what it looks like. You've got a, a, a table that lists uh, port to Ethernet mappings, and you can tell essentially if there's a single host on it or multiple uh, addresses associated with it. If there's multiple addresses, you know that there's a switch or a hub on that port. Otherwise, you can only believe that there's a single host until um, there's no way to tell if it's if there's multiple hosts. If you've only seen one MAC address, you just have to wait. Mm. So. What happens if we send traffic with, say, the, the MAC address from port four on port one? It turns out that most switches will just update that CAM table, and um, it'll no longer be available on port four. That MAC address will have been moved to port one. Um, if the machine that's actually on uh, port four then sends more traffic, it'll, j it'll just switch the table again. So. Typically, what happened is um, on most of the switches, whatever the last packet it sees um, is the pack is, is will update the cam table. Um, on a couple, there was a little bit of a timeout, um, but on the Cisco, it was only 30 seconds. It wasn't a real big deal. And the port lock behavior, which seems to only um, 
lock the port up to uh, a cable disconnect or a reboot. Um, now, each, each of these approaches has problems as far as um, its security implications. If you've got last packet updates, it's trivial to redirect traffic in the first place. If there's a timeout, it's harder to redirect traffic, but once you do, you don't have to worry about the other host um, taking, that, uh, taking the traffic back, because you've got, as long as you send one packet per 30 seconds or whatever the timeout happens to be, you uh, keep control of that port. And again, as we saw before, the lock, uh, port locking is uh, a huge pain in the ass and also uh, doesn't seem to be fully effective on the, at least on some of the Cisco's we tried. So this is the, uh, these are the results. Uh, the Cisco 2900, um, both of those ones with port security off, there's the timeout. Um, if the port security was enabled, um, then we just had to wait for a reboot or cable disconnect. Or if you have a nice way to cause the uh, machine to reboot, you're, you're doing well. And also there's a, a mention of a Cisco, an attack on the Cisco switch itself that would cause it to reboot. I imagine that would have the same effect. You're talking about the switch rebooting going on? Um, no, I'm, I'm speaking specific. Sorry, the question was, am I talking about a, a switch reboot or a host reboot? If the host disconnects or reboots, it seems to update the cam table. So it's, it's, it's not a trick. You don't have to reboot the Cisco. Just cause the, the target host to reboot. And on all the other ones, um, uh, this, the pro curve is a managed switch. Um, the Linksys is just this cheesy little uh, work group hub. And uh, the 3Com is a little bit more serious as well. All of them, whatever the last port it sees that packet on, that'll update the cam table. So why it works. Um, at the Ethernet level, there's no way to tell what uh, port traffic is coming in on. Um, so if you're listening on a monitoring port, you have no way to know. Um, all you know is that machine is uh, sending traffic. So by just choosing the traffic that you choose to send, um, you can ensure that that's not abnormal for the network and um, no monitoring device can really tell what's going on. Um, all it sees is valid traffic. So all unmanaged switches are there to therefore totally vulnerable. There's no way to make these uh, switches secure. On uh, more expensive switches, managed switches, you can uh, pull the cam table, um, but you know, if, unless you're generating so much, uh, like pulling it every small, small fraction of a second, you can sneak the, the attack through, and all you need is to redirect it um, for that one password, sorry, that one packet that has the password. Um, Oh, and if you are listening to the network for, say, broadcast traffic, like uh, ARP queries, you can tell exactly when you ought to tri trip the redirection. So you see someone uh, doing an ARP query for the mail server, you know that they're about to do their login sequence. You trip it right then, and uh, you get their login sequence, allow it to trip back, and uh, it, it can take some very, very small fraction of a second to go through that. Uh, uh, negotiation on a uh, on an Ethernet ne network, so it's easy to slip by. Also, you can tailor the attack so that uh, the attack code so that instead of um, having a system where you could do IP uh, fingerprinting or something, you can control exactly what the the replay traffic will be like, um, so that it doesn't look suspicious at all. So this is a little bit of a comparison, uh, sort of compare and contrast between the, the two types of attacks. Um, ARP cache corruption operates at layer three, that, that uh, intersection between the protocol layer and the data link layers, uh, sorry, the network layer and the data link layer in the OSI model. Um, ARP does provide a, a nice, clean man-in-the-middle attack, but it's easy to detect. Um, a lot of people know how to do this. Um, there's, there's code there uh, to catch people trying to do ARP cache corruption. <clears throat> the cam table poisoning attack takes place at the OSI level, level two. 
And while there's no good man in the middle attack, uh, you can probably uh, get about 95% of the traffic um, with something I'm, I'll, I'll describe in a second. And it's totally impossible to generate a uh, single signature for the, for the attack. Um, so even if the IDS vendors decide that this is a really good thing to write a, uh, a signature for, they may write um, a signature for the particular instantiation of, uh, of Tyrannus that I've written. But anyone is welcome to go and uh, change the packet that gets sent or write something more complicated that you know, does some interesting sampling uh, before, it, uh, uh, before it goes and does the attack. So uh, Tyrannus is the program that I wrote to demonstrate this attack. Um, it's, it's proof of concept code. It's a little bit rough in some places, but it's, it's, it's quite effective. Um, essentially, it spawns two threads. The first thread loops and just sends um, uh, packets that have the Ethernet source address of the target machine. So if the, um, if you, if the attacker's on uh, port 3 and the victim uh, is on port 5 and the, the machine that you want to redirect traffic from is on port 1, it'll just send uh, traffic on the, from the attacker's machine with the MAC address of the target machine. And that'll update the CAM table. Um, the second thread just sits there and uh, pretends to be a, a popper and IMAP server. So as far as the client is concerned, it's talking to the, the mail server. And it's speaking the pop protocol. And the uh, Tyrannus program just logs all that. So you get all the username and password pairs. So essentially, a normal uh, pop login sequence looks like this. You connect to the mail server, and uh, you feed it the user, then the username, pass. Um, sorry, you connect. Um, then the server sends a, a login banner. Um, then the client sends the username. Uh, server acknowledges that. The client sends the password, and then um, It'll tell you how many passwords, how many messages you've got waiting, and usually if there's zero, you'll just log out. Um, an IMAP session is a little bit easier to uh, to steal the password from because all you have to do is uh, send the password, and then uh, sorry, send the banner, and then grab the, the the username and password pair that the client feeds you. So what Tyrannus does is when it sees a SYN, it sends a SYNAC packet. Um, when it sees an ACK, it sends a pop banner. When it sees a user uh, frame, it'll send uh, an OK. When it gets a pass, it'll, uh, the original version just reset the connection. But I realized that that um, popped up a message on Outlook, so I extended it a little bit. Um, now it does the full, how many messages have I got from the stack command, and then allows the user to quit. Um, IMAP again is, is even easier. Um, there's less packets to, to juggle back and forth. And uh, if you just want to do a password stealing attack, you're, you're talking about uh, either four packets or three packets being sent, um, which doesn't take a lot of uh, time or bandwidth. So I've got a demonstration here. Um, essentially, we've got a, a just this little Linksys switch. I don't have a gateway set up. Um, but we've got a mail server at 10.0.1.10. We've got the victim machine, um, which is just a, 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 sorry, the mail server is an OpenBSD box. The victim machine is a, a, a Windows XP box um, at 10.0.1.20. And the attacker is a, a Linux box on 10.0.1.51. And uh, those MAC addresses are obviously bogus, but the ports are correct. So uh, let's see. So normally, if I want to connect to the mail server, this is what I'll see. Um, we get the, the normal pop banner, and then we do our regular login. Once I run Tyrannus, We see that um, we've got we've connected to the evil server instead, um, and we can do our login and so forth. 
And as we see, Tyrannus has captured the user uh, information, the login and password. And just for kicks. Here's Outlook. It's trying to connect, and it's just given up its username and password, and no error messages. It just had no clue. Any questions? Okay. Um, oh, I should show the denial of service mode. Um, So uh, just to reset, I did. I, I cleared my ARP table. And then uh, because there was no entry in the ARP table, it didn't ARP broadcast. The um, real server replied to it. And um, so that reset the CAM table inside the switch. Now, if I want to just deny service entirely to the, uh, to the mail server, I can do so by specifying the D flag, which just just sends the packets. It doesn't uh, spawn the, the thread that uh, pretends to be the proper IMAP server. It just uh, redirects the traffic. And we'll never get a reply back on our ping. So as I said, this is proof of concept code. It could be cleaned up a little bit to be like even more invisible. You said that one of the things you observed in your experiment in core brain was how whenever you moved your machine from one port over to another port on another switch, on another switch, right. the thing would go. Does chronic work so you can redirect something from a switch mix to a switch or does that all have to be um, Well, if they're all on the same switch, um, Sorry, one second. Um, I'm not positive. I, I don't think we tested that. Um, I, I think that it should redirect, but I wouldn't swear to it because uh, I haven't tested it. It ought to redirect because that's essentially one big backplane is what you've, what you've turned it into. Um, but don't quote me on it. Uh, I thought I saw another hand. Maybe not. Oh, sorry, the question? He asked me what would happen um, if you had basically three switches chained together. Would you be able to redirect traffic for uh, port one on switch one to port three on switch three, for example? And um, I said that I wasn't positive. I think you ought to be able to, because it, it essentially turns into one shared backplane. But I'm not positive about it. Is that it? Okay. So obviously, any other clear or any other protocol period could be spoofed this way. Um, you can do interesting things like uh, replace your syslog server with a, a, a Tyrannus version that will just eat all the uh, data. So instead of your uh, syslog host getting all the security alerts that it ought to, they just disappear. Um, if you were, this is a, a, another way to achieve the same effect, but it's, uh, you can just reconfigure a complete system with the uh, target server's uh, MAC address and IP address. And you ought to be able to obtain the same effect with, uh, by reconfiguring the MAC address and then just sending traffic, um, just you know, paying or whatever. Um, now, as I said before, there doesn't seem to be a way to uh, perform a, a perfect man in the middle attack. Um, you can generate traffic such that you can cause the um, target host to uh, reply to, say, an ARP packet uh, by sending it to the Ethernet broadcast, and then switch it uh, from 
the attacker's port back to the, the target's port. And by um, basically ping-ponging control of, that, uh, of the switch uh, between the two ports, you can achieve uh, a, a pretty good man-in-the-middle attack um, by just setting up a packet queue. Um, you redirect traffic to the attacking host, queue all the packets that are meant for the, um, for the server, switch it back, send them all, then redirect again. Um, but I, there, there's a good chance that packets would slip through here and there. Um, but that's not that big a concern because uh, it'll probably still work because we've got TCP handling all the, the, the um, handling all the drop packets. Um, So, as I said before, this attack can be pretty much invisible because, as I said before, Ethernet doesn't indicate what port a given packet came across, a given frame. Sorry, we're dealing with a, a, a layer two entity here. Um, so, it's pretty much impossible to, gen uh, to have a generalized uh, detection heuristic. Um, and again, depending on the type of switch, you may need to only send one packet. Um, if, there's, if there's that timeout, once you've won, and gain control of the switch, you've got it for as long as you uh, essentially need it. Uh, so you don't have, even have to be all that um, loud as far as what you're sending. Um, by analyzing what traffic is already going across the network, you can essentially map to that and not even generate any abnormal packets, anything that it wouldn't normally see at the intervals that you want uh, control of the, of the system, of the switch. So the only real defense, it turns out, is uh, uh, good crypto. Um, the port security mode doesn't seem to work on some Cisco's. And uh, we know that pulling the switch and trying to grab all of the um, cam table data, the, the, the mappings of port to MAC address, is not a good solution. Because either you're pulling um, and generating so much traffic through that polling that the switch isn't doing much else. Um, and pulling it, you know, fractions of a millisecond just isn't going to really do you much good because there's still a chance that you might miss it. So what you want to do is you want to um, move all uh, clear text logins to SSH, and you need to make sure that you're using good authentication so that someone can't do uh, something like run um, webman in the middle or SSH man in the middle. And even though, so you'll redirect the traffic, it'll uh, complain about a, a bad um, a key, but most users won't really know what that means, and it'll just continue to authenticate. Um, DSNF, uh, at least version 2.4, um, which is, I still, I still think, beta 1, um, has the, the web man in the middle and SSH man in the middle attacks. So, we may have to make sure that the system has good authentication as well in order to defend against this type of attack. So fortunately, um, SSH isn't really hard to set up. There's, there's implementations for any operating system that you, you really need to uh, have it for. And it's really trivial to uh, set up a client so that it uses SSH tunnels instead. And um, you just need that command line running on the, uh, on the client. And then you point your mail, uh, you point the mail client at uh, low closed, right same port, and instead of the um, regular mail server, SSH will prompt you for a password, and you can even make it even easier on your uh, on your users by uh, putting in uh, SSH agent. Um, if you don't require uh, shell access to that remote server anyway, um, it's a good idea to just. Uh, use S tunnel instead because uh, in order to do the, the SSH tunnels, you do need shell access. Um, also, you want to use the SSH public keys instead of just the uh, uh, symmetric uh, uh, password. 
So S-Tunnel is available at stunnel.org and can be used with certificates to authenticate the remote host and make sure that you know, no one's uh, uh, doing a man-in-the-middle attack on you via one of the other, uh, like our cache corruption or whatever. Um, and again, it's pretty easy to run on the, both the client and server and is available for Windows, so there's really no excuse to not be running this. Um, and it's a lot easier on the, uh, from the perspective of uh, maintaining your network because you don't have to deal with all the nastiness of port locking. And uh, if you get in the habit of it, it's really not a, a huge pain in the butt to, uh, to set up. So we know that this is a problem because Ethernet was never designed to provide a private channel. Um, switches were added to uh, increase performance. A lot of people took that to mean that it was possible to do a little bit of security with them. Yes? Um, 802.11i is working on making Ethernet a different design than having um, IP authentication or, or access. There's an IEPS group called TANA that's looking at general authentication of access for local nets. Um, I think I would never want people to say that, assume that layer 2 security is there, but. Um, right. Is, is 802.11i designed specifically for security, or? Oh, yes. Okay. 802.11i is a security working group that's looking at having servers and having a secure transmission method so that you can get from anybody who's trying to access into a, an authentication system and, okay. and uh, validate the user that way. Okay, so it sounds like 802.11i, whenever that uh, comes out, maybe may provide some, uh, some help against this. but. Um, all of the deployed versions of Ethernet uh, don't give you any security. So all sorts of protocols that are common on uh, intranets use clear text authentication. And then extending Tyrannus to uh, cope with these, uh, these systems is really, really trivial. It's, it's uh, plugging in FTP versus IMAP is, is, is not a real, uh, is not rocket science. Um, and once you can uh, grab the passwords for POP3, a lot of people will use them for other things. Um, being able to take over someone's CVS server is obviously handy. Um, eating data from the log servers is always good. Um, and so if an attacker gets that internet access um, or gets onto your switch in any way, shape, or form, um, you've probably lost at this point, unless you've got uh, strong crypto and strong authentication. Um, and tunnels are, uh, in encrypted tunnels are not uh, that big a deal to set up once you know uh, where to go and where to look for the information. So I suggest that everyone uh, look into that. Um, so again, uh, from the top, Tyrannus allows invisible traffic redirection because there's no generalized uh, uh, detection heuristic for this attack. Um, polling the cam table may catch it sometimes, but there's really no uh, guarantee of that, and you do need one of the more expensive managed switches in order to even be able to do that. Um, there's also the invisible denial of service, um, and that means that for the case of, say, log servers, um, your switch is actually less secure than a hub would have been, because on a hub, at least your data would have gotten to the log server. And uh, again, cryptography is best protection against this type of attack, and will help you uh, against the next attack as well. Um, if you're just pulling the, the cam table, someone else is going to come up with a better idea than mine. And uh, uh, the crypto would at least help you against that, whereas pulling the cam table wouldn't. So a lot of companies will pretend that their uh, internet is their, their trusted base, and anyone on their internet is, is, is OK to do whatever they want. And that's, that's a really, really horrible network design. Um, even some pretty large uh, financial institutions take the same view, and it's, it's really quite appalling. Uh, there was a statistic released a little while ago that said uh, over 70% of uh, successful attacks were uh, just the actual users on their network. Um, you can get information on Tyrannus and download the code at bitland.net slash Tyrannus. The uh, presentation is available in PDF and PowerPoint uh, format. Um, setting up tunnels is not a big deal, so Go to those URLs and find out how to do it. And I recommend Ethereal because it's a really, really good uh, network analyzer. 
And that's it. Are there any questions? <laughs>